Good evening, everybody. Nice to see you all here. Just checking my uh, microphone and everything. Um, yeah, we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be getting cracking in just a minute. Lovely to see so many of you joining me tonight. Um, we are gonna have a really great hour. You have got the um, the opportunity to ask me your questions. I'm going to do a quick presentation. I want to be talking about three really, really important steps in um, succeeding with your art, creating amazing realism, and just kind of, you know, doing what you've always wanted to do with your art. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And I am going to share a, a presentation with you. Um, now then, I'm just going to put the um, the chat on. Just hold on just a second though. Okay, so the chat has been uh, activated. That sounds very uh, posh, doesn't it? Um, but if you do want to uh, say hello in the chat, please. Oh, there's Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Uh, yeah, do do say hello in the chat. There's also the, um, we have a QA and a box um, that you can, oh gosh, you're all, you're all coming in now. Oh my goodness, there's loads of you saying hello. Uh, how lovely, how lovely. Catherine and Pam and Colleen and, uh, hi Colleen, I hope you're okay. Uh, Stephanie and Sandra and, and Sue and Claire and um, loads and loads of you. So, so, so nice to see everybody. Um, we're going to have a really, really super evening. I love these events because um, I can, I get to talk <laughs> for ages. <laughs> And you just have to sit and listen, which is the best kind of talking. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, that, it's my my favourite kind of thing. So um, now there's a couple of people with hands up. I I we can't um, we're on a webinar. It's not a meeting, so I can't I can't actually chat to you. But if you've got a question, you can pop. Um, I would prefer you to put a question into the Q and A box, or oh, somebody has already put their in. Uh, I'm happy you're here as well, Sherry. Um, so you can pop your questions into the Q and A box. Um, what would be really great, and I will answer as many questions as I can. But what would be really, really fabulous this evening is if you've got any burning questions around how you can get your work a little bit better, maybe how you can, uh, once you've listened to my. Um, presentation how you can maybe look at your mindset all of that kind of stuff because we're going to be talking about that too um so oh the worst time is showing volume um oh gosh we've got all sorts coming through here now i have the worst time with showing vol showing volume oh okay showing volume so i'm thinking volume as in um pamela will you just um give me a little bit more information on that uh and then i'm going to come back don't worry if you've put a, a question in there and i and i haven't answered you i will come after the presentation and i will be um I will be answering as many questions as I can. So lots and lots of you here tonight, which is amazing, absolutely amazing. I'm going to get cracking because we have an hour and I want to answer as many questions as I possibly can. So if you haven't been on one of my uh, live sessions before, uh, or maybe you haven't sort of met me in, in person via Zoom, I'm Bonnie. Um, I live in North Yorkshire in the UK. I'm a single mum to three amazing children. I've got loads of dogs, big, little, you name it. And I've got a I used to have a cat that just lived on the on the kitchen table. Now we have a cat that's crazy and just she goes in the sink most of the time, but a crazy cat. So um, I'm probably a crazy animal woman. <laughs> I think. Um, and I picked up my colored pencils in 20. 15 Christmas 2015 my daughter bought me a set of colored pencils and a coloring book because I had heard that coloring was was really great for uh, combating stress and anxiety and all of that kind of thing and it really really is um, and I completely fell in love with my color pencils um, I did coloring for sort of around probably about three or four months and then I was asked to draw a friend's horse um, and it kind of went from there and I just totally fell back in love with drawing I've done art at school loved it at school was completely put off when I did uh, two years at college when I was sort of 16 17 and I didn't do any art at all until I was 46 back in uh, 2016 um, and I, I think I'm very very similar to an awful lot of other people in that we're put off art we're told we can't do art we're told we're not good enough and we just put it on the back burner and we forget about it and we just get on with our everyday lives. And, and actually creativity is incredibly important, whether 
you make a living from it as I now do or whether it's just part of your everyday life because it has such incredible mindful qualities when you're actually being creative um I mean obviously I'm going to tell you to to pick up your colored pencils um but I would say um you know any kind of creativity is going to be incredible. Any kind of creativity, dancing, singing, all of that kind of stuff is going to be amazing. So um, for me, it's really, really important. It's really important that we get this, uh, we get creativity into our lives. And uh, for me, I, I, I started a pet portrait business back in 2017. It's still running. It's still very successful. I'm booked up until 2026. I've raised my prices from £40 to 1200 pounds now they start at and um I haven't done anything special I've just been me uh there are certain qualities about me that have uh, enabled me to be successful and I'm going to go through some of those right now as I'm going to share my presentation so let's have a look at uh sharing my screen here okay so let's come on to here on to here I'm just going to pop that there. Um, Okie dokie. So tonight I'm going to share my three biggest tips for elevate, elevating your coloured pencil work. Okay. Um, these three tips are based around removing limiting beliefs. I think that's a really, you, you might be sitting there thinking, oh no, I want to know about techniques and everything. Removing limiting beliefs is so, so, so important because um, that's going to put you into the mindset of I can rather than the mindset of I can't, I'm not going to be able to. Um, then I want to talk about identifying the most important factors for realism. Now, I've got people raising their hands. I, I, if you've got a question, please pop them into the Q&A box. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to identify the most important factors for realism. And then I want to share with you how you can create your plan of action for success, because for me, that was a really big these these three things. These are the three things that really, really helped elevate my art and helped me become successful in the art world. And I want to share those with you. Um, you've heard about me. I'm Bonnie. I, um, I teach. I'm a, a color pencil artist. I create commissions and um, my business is. Uh, sort of split between the commissions and the teaching. So I want to talk to you about removing limiting beliefs. We all have them. We all have limiting beliefs. It's those beliefs that come and stem from probably way, way back where we've maybe had an experience that hasn't gone particularly well. Um, we've maybe been told something, told, oh, you're not very good at that, or, oh, no, you can't do that because X, Y, Z. We all have these almost like glass ceilings, if you like, um, and they stop us from progressing. And it's really, really important to work out what those limiting beliefs are so that we can change our beliefs to more positive ones that are going to actually um, serve us better. Because basically limiting beliefs are we've got to find out why we've got them, what they're doing for us and what they're not doing for us, and then change them into something that's going to serve us better. This comes from um, self-reflection and self-reflection is actually really quite hard. And, you know, again, you might be sitting there going, well, what on earth has this got to do with realism? If you can get into a really great mindset, you are going to see success like you've never seen before. I, I honestly, I guarantee it. Um, my mindset, I, I mean, I've been through all sorts of different bits and pieces, but my mindset has always been, it's going to be okay. We're going to be all right. We're going to get through this. We're going to sort it out. I can, you know, whatever happens, we can get through it. And that's how I see it with my art as well. I've always had a very, very positive mindset. And I guess, you know, in a way that I'm lucky with that. I am lucky with that. Um, if, if you find that maybe you you uh, are somebody who maybe struggles to have a positive mindset, it's something that you can change. And kind of identifying what your limiting beliefs are is going to really, really help that. So self-reflection and then creating new habits. Um, again, really, really important for just sort of switching things around so that you're coming to your art, you're coming to your, uh, your colored pencil drawings with that mindset that I can do anything. 
I mean, can you imagine just, you know, rifling through Pixabay or Pexels or Unsplash or, you know, one of the, the fabulous um, groups on Facebook and looking at all those incredible photos and falling in love with a photograph and then thinking, oh, I could draw that. Oh, my goodness, I could draw that. Um, that is one of the most amazing feelings to have. If you love drawing, knowing that you can pick up any any photograph and knowing that you can actually reproduce that as a realistic drawing is a wonderful, wonderful thought. And that comes from removing your limiting beliefs. So we have to identify what our limiting beliefs are. Um, and there's, oh gosh, honestly, you could go on forever. There's like, you know, big exercises or you could go on a course for like a week to find out what your limiting beliefs are. But basically um, doing a little bit of work around when do you make up excuses? So, when, you know, when do you make excuses not to do something? Um, it could come through again. When do you tend to procrastinate? Um, if you've got a, uh, and, and I find that actually making up excuses also comes through uh, when we start to compare ourselves with other artists as well. You know, we're on Facebook, we're on uh, on Instagram, we're flicking through, we're seeing amazing drawings pop up. And it's almost like, well, I, I could never do that. I could never do that. So I'm just not even going to bother. If you know, if I try and do that, I'm going to fail. So why bother trying if I'm going to fail? I'm only going to feel terrible about it. And then we have that. That's one of those limiting beliefs. I can't do it. I'm not able. I'm not good enough. And what we forget is that actually it takes quite a long time to learn skills. It takes a really long time to learn skills. Some people a, a, a speedier than others some people take longer depending on personality depending on personal circumstances home life work all of that kind of thing some people you know just for me for example when I started drawing and I wanted to really um, develop and progress it was an obsession um, it, it, I was obsessed with it <laughs> I you know I'd I'd take my children to school in the morning. I'd go to my nine to five job, which was an hour's commute away. I'd come back in the evening. I'd do the tea. I'd sort of my children. I had horses at the time as well, my dogs. Um, and as soon as all that was sorted, I'd be at my drawing board. I could not wait to start drawing. I just couldn't wait. So I would be drawing into the night. I was completely obsessed. Um, I'm not saying everybody has to do that. A lot of people talk about not having time. Again, very much a limiting belief, uh, you know, not, not having enough time to be able to do anything. And actually, we all have the same amount of time and it's about what you prioritise. Um, and when do you usually make assumptions? What do you assume about, you know, your work? What do you assume about your how you can develop? Um, you know, I've seen people start drawing uh, well, uh, like me, you know, you 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 do your first drawing and, and you're so proud of it. And then you you almost have a, uh, you know, a, a sort of like a, a feeling of where you want to develop. Or maybe you have a, a fabulous uh, mentor or something that you can ask for critiques and everything for. And, you know, you then compare three months go back to your first one and you think oh my goodness look at you know look at how, how far I've come if you can think that way rather than always making the assumption that oh you know well I'm not developing I'm not doing this I'm not doing that for me that's a really 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 key part in becoming successful in your drawing is having that uh, you know incredibly healthy mindset and finding out what is limiting you um, and changing those beliefs to ones where, do you know what? I can do this. What What's stopping me? If they can do it, why can't I do it? Um, you know, so again, a lot of self-reflection and it's something that I've done a huge amount of um, this, this self-reflection, working out, you know, what my what my beliefs are and how I can change them. Now, when it comes to creating new habits, you know, you'll have heard this an awful lot and it's in all of the self-help books and all of that kind of stuff. And I do listen to an awful lot of podcasts, but it really is about practicing small steps. And what I've done differently in this presentation to how I normally talk is I've swapped the words visualization for rehearsing. 
Normally I would talk about visualization. I'm a very visual person. I visualize everything. If I'm gonna start a new drawing, I'll have already visualized it in my head. Having listened to the Joe Dispenza uh, podcast, I've swapped when I talk about visualizing um, most of the time now to talk about rehearsing. And it's about that mental rehearsal, how you, because when you talk about visualization, qu quite a few people don't really get you know, what I'm trying to sort of uh, put across. And a lot of people don't actually see pictures in their head. So that's not a very helpful word sometimes. Um, so rehearsing is a much better way of trying to describe what I'm trying to say. And basically we're rehearsing what it is that we're gonna do. It's a mental rehearsal of what we're going to do. So, you know, you get a, a, a picture that you're going to do as a commission. You mentally rehearse how you're drawing it. You can lie in bed, you can do a meditation. You can probably not in, I mean, I do in the car, but it's probably not a good idea to do in the car because you'll, you'll find yourself somewhere where you're not supposed to be. Um, but, you know, uh, quietly sitting down in the bath, in the shower, you know, walking the dog mentally rehearsing how you're going to be drawing your your picture mentally rehearsing how you want to live as an artist mentally rehearsing how your business is going to grow mentally rehearsing how um you know amazing your hobby is going to make you feel rehearsing the feelings rehearsing the sights and the sounds and how everything like that is working uh you know around for you and it's a really really super super way of um getting to grips with you know getting becoming more developed in your skills um practicing these new habits daily um it again incredibly important incredibly important to practice what it is that you're doing um practice we well people say practice makes perfect practice doesn't make perfect practice makes uh you know it makes a difference it makes change practice helps you you know to create these different habits and everything and small persistent steps you know I know for a fact I've been sort of uh trying to diet I've been on like a bit of a detox thing and uh, I did 30 day detox and I know for a fact that having doing the same small steps every day has helped me break habits break unhealthy habits of you know eating too many biscuits and all of that kind of stuff it's exactly the same for our art small steps for our art if you find yourself procrastinating um instead of going and sitting at your drawing board and doing some drawing practice some small steps what do you do can you create a little bit of a ritual around how you get to your drawing board how you set your drawing board out do you have candles around you do you have a lovely drink you know what do you do and make sure that these steps are, are replicated every single day and you'll soon find that it becomes much much easier to get through that procrastination stage so um, identifying the most important factor for realism. OK, so I get really excited about this subject. Obviously, I, I'm a realist, uh, a realism artist. I, is, what I do isn't hyper realism. It's um, for me, um, people talk about realism. Why do we want to draw realism when you can have a photograph? I, do you know? I get it. For me, realism chose me. I didn't choose it. It chose me. It's what happens in my brain. It's what comes down my arm into my pencil. It, I love the process of creating realistic portraits. I love the process, absolutely love it. And that's why I create realism portraits um, and why the majority of other people create realism portraits as well. They love the process. And now that I teach sort of, I teach over 3,000 3, students and one of the biggest things that I see that can help with development is truly understanding how values and details factor in realism. And if you've ever had a critique from me, you will know that I bang on about values all of the time. Values are your darks and your lights, your, your shades, if you like. Um, if you take a look at a black and white drawing, you know all you're going to get there are values you're going to get darks you're going to get midtones you're going to get highlights when you bring color into the mix it can get really really confusing um you know because we sort of we miss we miss things because color's there and what happens is that details become a more important factor than values 
I'm going to try and uh, give you some examples around this as well. Um, and I want to talk about the value of using values. So <laughs> I love this. Lucy was really mad. She, it's not on brand. And I was like, yes, but, you know, this is what I want to talk about. Values versus details in the boxing ring. On the blue side, we've got values. On the red side, we've got details. Who's going to win? Who is going to create the most realistic portrait? Is it the values or is it the details? Um, and this is a, a conversation that we could have for a very long time. You can have details galore. And we're going to go through in a minute about what we see details as. But you can have details galore. But if your values are lacking, then you won't have a realistic drawing. However, you can have values galore. But if there are no details, doesn't matter because your values are what makes the realism. OK, values are what makes realism, not details. Um, and that's a question I'm going to be asking you in a second. Now, I'm going to show you these two horses. These were done, I think, 2017, 2018. Beautiful. Draw They're my drawings. Beautiful drawings, beautiful portraits, two horses. You can see there's a lot. The, the, the values are pretty good, actually. But there's a lot of detail, a lot of what I call detail. So there's a lot of hair, you know, we can see the hair marks, we can see all of the frizzy bits in the mane. Um, and at the time, you know, I was incredibly proud of both of these. Um, we've got some nice values on this one, some really nice lighting. Uh, both of these are from my, my own photos, but there's a lot of hair strokes, a lot of hair strokes. We can see all of the texture and everything in the horses. Um, and this is where, I want to talk to you about, and this this is this is where the details come in. Now, um, what what I tend to find with a lot of people starting out when I do critiques for them is that we get all of the details because that's what we think is going to make something realistic, and it and the the uh, the values are lacking, so we don't have any of the shading, we don't have any of the shadows, we don't have any of the um, the highlights, and that's that's where I'm sort of you know what, what I'm kind of trying to trying to talk about and how I've tried to give this example these ones where they've got a lot of hair detail and then we look at these two okay so I'm going to flick back again so we put these two lovely portraits and then we look at these two what's the difference you know the difference is that I haven't put all of the hair details in. I put a little bit in, we've got a bit of an idea of, but I haven't gone hell for leather with all of those details. What I've concentrated on are what I call details. And what I call details are the little tiny nuances of light and dark that occur on every single picture of an animal that you're going to draw. Horses are a really, really good example to show you this. OK, so if we start with this lovely um, chestnut mare here, we can see little nuances. So the, 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 the veins, little tiny bits of changing in the um, you can see where my arrow is here, little bits of change in the value where it gets a little bit darker, slightly darker. Then it gets a little bit lighter, um, you know, down on the on the um, on the nose bone here, a little bit darker, a little bit lighter. That's what I class as details. Those are the details that I want you to be putting into your drawings because your drawings are going to look incredible if you concentrate on those tiny little nuances. This one here, um, there's a couple of years between these two. Uh, this was from a really, really good photograph. Uh, it was a paid for photograph. Again, we've got details in here, but not lots and lots of hair strokes. Um, you know, the main, we have got some texture and everything in here, but it's not crazily overdone. Uh, we've got the lovely lighting on the face, um, you know, soft lighting, how your how your darks flow into your lights, then flow back into your darks, but not lots and lots of hair details. And it's the hair details that can stop your pieces looking realistic. Um, there's going to be areas where you want to put those in. And normally that would be around where you're focusing. So you're focusing on an eye or sort of like a, a very realistic muzzle or something like that. That's where you do want to cram all of the little nooks and crannies and everything into there. 
but on the you know on the main body of the horse on the main face of the horse concentrating just on those little nuances the tiny subtle changes in dark and light are going to give you a much more realistic look um, so why are values so important for drawing realism and here I've given you three examples the top one I did this in 2017 so this was um, uh, for a friend of mine um, her photos but it was after I'd done an Anne Kohlberg um, workshop and I was like, oh, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have a go drawing humans. And you can see uh, they're lovely. The, you know, there's nothing wrong with them. I was incredibly proud of them, but you can see that the, the skin tones are lacking so much in value. I've got the values correct in the coats. They're great. And then the faces, these little sort of pale faces and the pale hair, really, really lacking detail. We then look at two more pieces that I've drawn recently. This one I've finished a few weeks ago. You can really see where I started to concentrate in the in the little hands here. Um, you know, in fact, this hand here, I was so worried that I got too dark. My daughter commented she looked like she'd had a, a run in with some fake tan. Um, but, you know, I've really concentrated on elevating how I use values this little uh, little girl here as well you know getting everything um all of the shadows beautifully dark all of the highlights beautifully light and you can see the contrast that you get when you start to use your values um it makes an enormous difference enormous difference and it makes things look much more realistic that's why values are so important they bring out the structure of what it is that you're drawing with an animal it will give you the the structure of the face it will make it look 3d people will comment that oh my goodness you know you, i can i can feel it breathe i can hear it bark it looks like it's going to step off the page um you know with humans which is something that i'm i am new to uh getting the values in the skin is really tricky really tricky because it's like hang on a second you know she's she's a a, a fair-skinned child and i'm using dark orange um you know and it's just something that we have to really really concentrate on because for realism values are exactly what realism needs not tons and tons of details so if we look at this one here, this is the first drawing that I did back in 2016. Um, and we look at this one, we can say, you know, what's missing from this? What's missing from this are what you call details, what other people call details and values. So we're missing all of the lovely values in the face. There's no structure to the face. It's very flat. Um, you know, the, the, the pencil strokes are kind of all going this way. They're not following those undulating, uh, undulating lines that horses have got on their faces. Um, and there's no sort of um, uh, tiny sort of detail uh, um, areas in the face at all, you know, around the eye, that dip above the eye, that kind of thing. There's, there's none of that. So um, this one is missing all of that. Okay. So if we look at this one, this is a piece that uh, you could call this finished, these little fox cubs here, you could call this a finished sketch and they look really quite sweet and lovely. Um, we've got, you know, quite a lot of uh, sort of value detail in here. It's very flat. If we move on to the next picture, when in fact we had finished it, you can see what a major difference values make when we start to really bring in those dark elements, really start to bring in the uh, how the fur works. So it's not necessarily about bringing fur lines in, it's more about how we can structure the fur so it looks like you can sink your fingers into it. Um, you know, so for this one, it's very much about using those values rather than trying to get all of the fur strokes in. So this is the question I want to ask you. When you think or talk about details, what do you mean? When, you know, if you're thinking, oh, I've got to get all of those details in, or, uh, you know, I've been given this really terrible photograph and I need to have a look at another photo of a dog that's similar and get all of the details in, what do you mean? And I want you to imagine that we're going to draw this, this lovely dog here. It's not, it's not the most brilliant photograph to work from because it is sort of, uh, you know, sort of slightly out of focus. But which elements do you see as details? And this is where um, I see people, and, and even though it's really nice and soft, the, the, the fur details here are really nice and soft, we get all of the fur details in here. So you, you, the dog, instead of it looking really sleek and shiny, it ends up becoming really quite 
um, textured. If you're thinking about drawing a black Labrador, for example, that's got very similar fur to this, you're thinking that beautiful, soft, silky fur. If you start to bring lots and lots of fur details in, you're going to lose the quality of the fur and you're going to get this sort of uh, texture going on in there. So that's where you miss out the fur line detail and you concentrate on your lighting. So you've got this area here, really dark, and it's sort of, you can't see any fur details in here. Oh, sorry. Uh, you can't see any fur details in here at all, which is wonderful. So draw what you see, you know, that lovely soft black area. You don't need any details in here. You can get a little bit of details in these little highlighty areas in here. Um, you know, so you get that lovely shine coming through around these eyes here, leave this all nice and, and uh, really, really dark. You don't need any details in there either. We as humans are incredibly clever. We've got very, very clever brains that let us down the majority of the time. And our brains, I don't know whether you've seen those things on Facebook where uh, you've got a paragraph and you've, all of the words are there, but the letters are jumbled up. So you've got all of the right letters, but all in the wrong order. And you look at it and you go and then they say, oh, only three people in the whole world can read this. And you're like, oh, yay, I'm one of the three people. Um, <laughs> but we can all read it. You know, you read it because your brain just sort of sorts things out, misses letters out and, and, and off you go and you read it. You, when, when you read words, you know, unless you've got sort of dyslexia or something like that, you, you, you don't have to read every single letter in a word you you recognize the shape of the letter and you read it it's exactly the same when you're looking at uh, and you're drawing animals like this when when i'm viewing something like this i don't want to see every single fur bit of fur because it actually it's overwhelming to my brain to see every single bit of fur so what we need to do is get the fabulous details get all of those gorgeous little nuances and tiny 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 weeny little details into things like eyes and noses and you can go to town on the mouth when it comes to the fur simplify it a little bit you know use those really dark areas to not bring any detail in bring a little bit of detail and you'll want to bring a little bit of detail around this white area here honestly you don't really need all of that hair there but we've become fixated on oh, i've just got to get this hair here and i've got to, oh i've got to get the little white bits of hair around there we don't need to we just don't need to this one again uh a horse here which elements of this because this is a really textured horse okay um this this doesn't have that lovely shiny quality that the dog had before so it looks sort of quite quite dry um and you know yes we could go to town with this and we could bring all of this lovely texture in but is it going to look a little bit uh overkill and i my suspicion is yeah it, it probably will when we come to drawing this forelock a lot of people find uh, forelocks challenging and it's because we try to draw every single hair, you know, because we go, well, horses forelocks have got long hair and they're very fine and we're just going to draw all of those in. And then what we get is we get this sort of stringy um, mess, uh, basically. But actually, if we just concentrate on where the lights and the darts come from, and if you can see me in the screen, you see me just squinting, I'll squint at my, draw, at my drawing or my photograph, my squint. What I'll see is I'll see highlights here, and then this is sort of dark. There's a bit of a highlight here. This is dark. And I'll concentrate on those areas. I'll just concentrate on my darks and my lights. And then I can bring a little tiny bit of detail in over the top, but not drawing all of those hair strokes. And the same with the face. You know, yes, there's some beautiful detail and we can kind of bring a little bit of that in where we need to. And then we can just sort of um, soften it slightly. So it's not about getting every single fur stroke in there because it would just it's just overkill. It overwhelms. It's about deciding where am I going to put the details and where am I just going to soften it and leave it out a little bit. Thirdly, your plan of action. OK, so this is really, really important. I think if you're wanting to develop your work, what do you do? You know, do you just sit there and go, oh, I'm so rubbish at my drawing. <laughs> I'm so rubbish. I can't do it. I'm not going to do it anymore. Or do you make a plan of action? How many of us sit down and look at our drawing and pick out all of the bits that you're really, really unhappy with? What well, that's rubbish. And somebody will go, oh my goodness, that's amazing. Your drawing's really good. And you'll go, yeah, but I could have done that bit better. Oh, that, that bit went a bit wrong. And you know, and it's like, you know, just take the compliment. <laughs> Say, thank you very much. I'm very proud of my drawing. Um, so 
making a plan of action and not a plan of action for all of your drawings, but I would take your latest piece, I'd take a photograph of it. Um, this, is a, this is a part of a planner that we've just introduced to the Ignite membership. So anybody who's joining Ignite in September will be getting this planner and it's actually a, um, you can fill it in as well, it's uh, editable. So you, you can actually upload your, uh, your images into this and you can type into it, which is really awesome. Um, and what I want you to do is take a photograph of your latest piece and I want you to write down what you're proud of and what's going well. OK, now it could just be one thing. If you can really only find one thing, it could be 10 things. It could be 50 things. Um, but I want you to write down what you're proud of. You know, um, you might be sitting there now thinking, well, I'm not, I'm, every drawing I do, I'm not proud of getting a piece of paper out and drawing of it or drawing or drawing on it, getting your pencils out, being creative. That is something to be incredibly proud of, because there's a lot of people out there who don't. OK, so that's one point that everybody can put down. I am being creative and I'm really proud of that. So work out what you're proud of. Then what I want you to do is work out what you have identified as needing to develop. Now, this could be, be this could be definitely about your drawing. So it could be, oh, I've been listening to Bonnie today and I really want to start concentrating on my values a little bit more. If I concentrate on those, my piece is gonna look more realistic. It could be, do you know what? I really want to work on my mindset. I really want to um, look at my what's holding me back, look at my limiting beliefs and how I can swap those for beliefs that actually are going to serve me and, um, you know, help me get to where I want to be. Um, it is it is challenging self-reflection it really is challenging but it's so worth it um and then you write down what you've identified as you want to develop then and this is the really really important part how will i develop it what am i going to do um and the best thing to do now so write it down what you're going to do and make a pact that this is what you're going to do as well as writing it down and i know you'll think you sound an absolute silly sausage but as well as writing it down I want you to say it out loud because as soon as words come out of your mouth and your brain hears it that then becomes kind of locked in we've talked about the uh, reticular activating system before it's like the filtering system that your brain has and um, as soon as you start to make decisions and plans and everything your brain then starts to filter things that are going to enable you to you know um, be successful in that plan um, so I want you to write down what you're going to ch uh, change, uh, um, how you're going to develop it. And I want you to say out loud how you're going to do it. It could be, you know, do you know what? I'm going to listen to some of those podcasts that Bonnie talks about. Um, I'm going to read a few self-help books. A couple of really good self-help books are The Big Leap. I would highly, highly, highly recommend The Big Leap. And I would also recommend the, um, oh God, what's the other one called? Um, I can't remember what the other one's called. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a YouTube video with a load of them on. But The Big Leap, I would definitely recommend The Big Leap to everybody. Everybody should read that book. It is amazing. The cover has got a, a fish jumping into a or jumping out of a fishbowl. It's a really good book. And it helps you with limiting beliefs and working out how you can sort of change habits and everything. So um, those are those are basically the three things really looking at your mindset and you're finding out what's limiting you what's stopping you from your full potential really looking at how you're creating your realistic pieces how you are um you know uh, how you're how you're identifying details and then making your plan of action so uh, I'm going to come back to the Q&A in a second now, but the, my next live events, if you haven't already signed up, I've got one on Sunday, the 3rd of September at two o'clock. That is a live draw event. I think we're drawing paws, dog paws. Sunday, the 10th of September at two o'clock uh, in the afternoon, UK time, we're drawing a tiger's eye. So if you haven't signed up for that, do. And then the Ignite membership opens for new members on the 11th of September at 12 o'clock. And this time is only open for a week. Um, so get those dates down and I'm now going to stop sharing and I'm going to come into the Q&A and I'm going to have a look at um, what it is that we're, um, we've got in here. Now, I'm going to look at the Q&A section first um, and, and then I'll have a quick look into the chat. But if you've got a burning question, do, do put it into the Q&A bit. Uh, OK, so. 
uh, so Kevin's put best way to do eyelashes of a child on pastel paper. OK, so this, Kevin, really, really, again, comes down to details and values. It depends on whether you're doing a very close up shot of, of the child's face, in which case you may well have an awful lot of detail in there. It also depends on your photograph. But if we uh, if we went back to the the um, the little girl in the daffodils that I was drawing before, the the her eyelashes were literally just a few pencil strokes. That's all they were. It was a semblance of a shape. And that's what I would really, um, you know, urge you to do is not try to draw all of the tiny. This is what our human brain wants to do. We see eyelashes as like eyelashes, you know, hoo -hoo. Uh, and then we try and draw them like that. And then they don't look right. Really look at the shape, the value. And you'll probably find that they're just sort of dark smudges or little sort of jaggy lines rather than what you would you know normally see as an eyelash and that's what I would suggest with that um uh Pamela uh okay so Pamela says I've got the worst time with showing volume what can I do and then uh just sort of beef that out a little bit like everything I draw seems to be on the same plane this is very much about value uh Pamela so uh, uh, what I'm thinking is, what you're saying to me is that everything's sort of a little bit flat. So when you look at it, it just looks like everything's just there on just there, rather than nose here, eyes here, ears there. It, it all just looks a little bit flat. That's all to do with your values. So getting your darks nice and dark, your lights nice and light, and your midtones. It's also about your pencil strokes. So if you're drawing, um, if you're drawing a dog, so say you're drawing a smooth coated dog, we'll take a Labrador, for example, you've got you've got the hair going back that way. You've got the cheekbones here kind of coming this way. Then you've got hair going this way. Uh, then, of course, you've got the muzzle area here, uh, you know, and it's all very much about how you're bringing and you're structuring the shading that you're putting into those places. And I talk about fur strokes. Um, and yes, you know, the, the, we follow the, the direction of the fur as it's growing. Um, but being careful not to draw every single tiny little line. As you're kind of bringing your pencil in, in the direction of the fur growth, you're also going to be looking at the little nuances, the little darks and the lights and everything. That's going to give your dog or whatever it is that you're drawing structure and you're going to be able to see the structure of the face like it's 3D. And that's what's going to really, really help. Um, Cheryl, is it normal to get shine on graphics drafting film? Absolutely, Cheryl. Uh, yeah, <laughs> one thing that I always say, which sounds very pedantic, is if it, it, just look at it head on. And if it's fine head on, it's fine. If you start moving it around and look at it at an angle, don't do that because <laughs> it will be shiny. Um, so yeah, it is very, it's very normal on, on most surfaces that you get a bit of a shine. Also, when is it best to use a slice tool and when to indent tool? This is quite personal, Kevin. Slice tool I tend to use on, on drafting film only because that's how I prefer to use it. I use predominantly drafting film and pastel mat. And um, I don't tend to use the the slice tool on pastel mat other artists do I don't I don't like it I find I can do everything with my pencils on pastel mat occasionally I might you know use it for something like a stitching or something um so I would say get to know your slice tool don't overuse it don't use it in place of good pencil work your pencil work should always come first and your slice tool is a tool just to help kind of get a little bit of texture or highlight or something um indenting tool I tend to use those for whiskers and ears do you know there are some incredible pencil artists out there who use it all over the fur um i don't have the patience to be able to do that i get i get bored not using my pencils and just sort of putting marks in but it, again it's something to really um have a play around with uh gabrielle i struggle to know which colors i should use when creating pictures i think you're not alone gabrielle at all this is a question i get an awful lot you know how do i pick my colors for me, um, my first drawings, I'll tell you exactly what I did. I got my picture on my phone and I got my pencils and I put my pencils next to my phone and I went, which colour's similar? And then I used that colour. <laughs> that's, that's all I did. So if it was a brownie colour, I'd use a brown. At that point, I didn't really understand about layering. I didn't really understand about the colour wheel, complementary colours, all of that kind of thing. 
my I think fail safe easy way of really starting to understand color is to take your picture um you probably have to split it into you know unless you've got a very uh an animal that's sort of like the same color all over um take your little sort of square or whatever it is that you're drawing and I would identify the lightest color so it could be like an ivory it could be a buff titanium it could be a, a, a um, it could be as dark as a burnt sienna you know it depends on what the picture is but pick the lightest color pick the darkest color which could be a uh, caput morton violet could be black could be a gray could be a, a blue um, and then pick a color the color in, in between sort of like the mid-tones you've got three colors that you're starting with um, and I would work with those and then you can bring other colors into the mix that aren't going to cause those colors problems so if you're um, if you've got orange so if your animal is predominantly orange brownie orange color um, if you bring in uh, this is a tricky one actually because the complementary color of orange is blue but with colored pencil if you bring a blue pencil in over the top of your orange you are going to get as like a sludgy green um, which might be okay for some shadows but I would then tend to go round so the color wheel looks like this um, let's have a look at that pure color Oops. we go with the pure color as orange so pure color is orange here complementary is blue I wouldn't use blue as a um, as a shadow color on an orange because it is going to go like a sludgy green. So I would I tend to go this way. So this is a split complementary. This is a triadic. So I'd go into the more purpley hues. Actually, if you bring greens into your oranges, they can look really cool too. So understanding a little bit about color theory is really important when you're looking at colors. Understanding the basics. So red and yellow make red and yellow make orange, uh, yellow and blue make green. So anything that's got yellow in it, like an orange, and you mix it with blue, it's gonna go like a shade of green. Understanding that, which is the very, very basic uh, color theory is gonna help. Um, but don't worry too much about your colors. It's not the color that matters, it's your values. So as long as you're getting your darks and your lights right, your colors will come. The more you do, the more you'll understand about color. It will naturally start to come, I promise you. Uh, Hazel, no, you're not. Yes, you are supposed to see me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Lynette, how do you choose the right picture to draw? I would say um, choosing the right picture to draw, it should uh, excite you. You should see the picture and it should there should be something in the picture that is like, oh, my goodness, I I can't wait to draw this. If you're a commissioned artist, you don't really get to choose. You get sent pictures and obviously you might get a range of them to choose from. But um, if you're choosing something for your, for just you to draw, then I, I tend to go for things that have got good lighting, uh, an interesting subject, something that maybe is going to really challenge me, uh, something that's going to put me out of my comfort zone and make me really think. Um, you know, so I think when you choose a picture, it should it should excite you definitely. Krista, I would really like to know how you set up uh, set up your line work before you start. Besides the outer lines and main features, how far do you go with the details? Okay, that's a really great question, Krista. Um, when I'm doing a tutorial, my line drawings tend to be more um, more uh, more detailed, uh, just because it then. Um, it will help those who need more detail and those who don't need more detail can leave them out, you know, so they tend to be a little bit more detailed, but never like crazy detailed. I, to be honest, I always like kind of over over egg my line drawings and then regret it and never learn. <laughs> um, my own line drawings, I tend to uh, try and keep them relatively simple because I, I just get irritated with them. So I'm, I'm drawing a piece at the moment. So my on my drawing board, it's on drafting film. I've got a line drawing that's on a printout and it's underneath the film. The majority of the time, I don't have the line drawing showing. I put another piece of paper underneath so I can't see anything and I just work freehand because the, the lines, they just confuse me and irritate me. Um, so I think it's very much up to the individual. Some people like to put a huge amount of detail in. Some people don't like to put a huge amount of detail in. There's no right or wrong way. Um, I think it's, it's what works for you. Uh, and you'll find that as you go through your pieces, you'll find what works for you. 
Um, Sandy, how can I get rid of the scratchy look on my coloured pencil art? I have polychromos, luminance and Pablo pencils. I'm using pastel matte mostly. Okay, Sandy, so pastel matte is a wonderful surface. It, at the moment, is going through some quality issues again, which is incredibly frustrating. If you are lucky enough to get what pastel matte can, it is marketed at, which is a unique velvety surface, you are so lucky. It, for me, the, the good pastel mat feels like an old tea towel. It feels like it's been washed a thousand times. It's soft, it's velvety. You can't really see any um, texture. It, it, it's, it's just like velvety. Um, the stuff that I've been getting recently, which I, I'm, I refuse to use and I'm sending back, is like concrete. It's just like it's actually got bumps on it and it is it, nigh on impossible to use. It's horrible. Now, if you're using a piece of pastel mat that's all bumpy, then it's not surprising that you're finding that you've got a scratchy look on, on the pastel mat. If, however, you have got a relatively velvety piece, uh, for me, it's about the layering. So um, enough layers and enough layers might be two layers or it might be 20 layers um it's using the techniques where you put your light colors over the top of dark which is an incredibly useful technique for pastel matte um particularly when you're using the pencils that you're using i would always start with polychromos purely for a psychological reason rather than any other reason it's it's more um it's more because the polychromos are hard and dry. So you use them nice and gently on your pastel mat. The pigment kind of comes off, sits on top of the, uh, on top of the tooth. And then when you then bring more layers in, particularly if you use light colors over the top of dark, um, your pigment then just starts to move around a little bit and it's lovely. If you then, if you start with your softer pencils, nothing wrong with that at all, but the pigment sticks to the pastel matte tooth. So if you're trying to lift it with a kneadable eraser, it's much harder. If you're trying to kind of blend it a little bit, just gently, it's a little bit harder. Um, ultimately, it doesn't matter how you lay your pencils because the end result is gonna look the same. It's just that psychological getting over the graininess. Um, uh, Colin, when can, you, when can you join? 11th of September, the doors open. Um, my, uh, Marcy, how can I get past my need for instant grat gratification in my artwork? Realistic colour pencil drawings takes an enormous amount of patience and the time commitment required to complete a single piece is holding me back from trying realism. What an amazing, amazing question, uh, Marcy. I completely get you. And it's one of the reasons why, uh, why I love pastel mat and why I um, structure things the way I do and why I work in sections because I'm very much like you. Um, I don't have the patience of the saint, but I do really love the process. I've learned to love the process more. When I first started, it was all about the ears and the nose and the features. And then the, we got the neck and I was like, oh no, I just need to get rid of this now and onto the next one. Now I'm drawing a horse at the minute. I've spent probably about 12 hours drawing a neck. And I'm not even finished yet, but I love the process and I've learned to love the process is that meditative, beautiful quality. So what I would suggest is you find a paper that you really like that works for your techniques. For me, it's pastel mat and drafting film. When I draw something, I try and make it look as pretty as possible as quickly as possible, which is why I work in sections rather than all over. So it's looking a little bit less messy for uh, a shorter period of time. Things like eyes, I'll always draw the outside of the eye first and then the pupil. Um, I get a prettier feel. I and, and I never leave, if I'm drawing, I will never get up and leave my drawing for, you know, until the next day. If I'm at a point where it looks horrible, because when I come back to sit in my drawing board and I take my glassing paper off, I'll sit there and I'll go, Oh my God, that looks horrible. So I'll always finish my drawing at a point where I'm really, really happy with it and it's looking okay. Um, it may be that actually you quite like using drafting film because you can you use fewer layers. Um, and you know, I'm not saying it's quicker, but it's definitely fewer layers and you can get you can get through it a little bit quicker. Um, if it's holding you back from trying uh, realism, I, the other thing that I would say as well is really look at what's going on in your life because why can't, what is it that's stopping you from sitting down for a period of time and doing something that 
you know, it sounds like you want to do it. So what is it that's stopping you? What's your limiting belief? Is your limiting belief, I don't have patience? What I would suggest is that you look in other areas of your life where you do have patience and you have been really patient and see if you can kind of get the attributes that you've used in that period of your life and bring it to your realism. Realism is not for everybody. You don't have to do realism, um, but it's, I, I, I mean, I love it. Um, gosh, there's loads and loads of questions here. Uh, did I have a formal art education? Why did you choose to specialize in color pencil and do you ever use any other media? Um, so I left school at 15 in 1985. Um, I took my O levels and I went on to uh, a local art college and I did a BTEC national diploma in general art and design. And I was there for two years and absolutely hated it. <laughs> um, bizarrely, the only part of those two years that I really enjoyed was when we did watercolour and we drew a blackberry or we painted a tiny weeny little blackberry and I was the best one. <laughs> and I haven't picked up a paintbrush since. Um, I, I hated it and I was told I wasn't good. I wouldn't get into art college. I wanted to go and do a degree. And I ended up leaving at the age of 17 with no placement at uh, Polytechnic it was back then. And I went and I became a tea girl at a local advertising agency. Taught myself to type, became a typesetter, became a graphic designer, ended up being the studio manager for a big insurance company um, and then did coaching and all of that kind of stuff. Um, why did I choose to specialise in colour pencil? Because I'd heard about colouring books. I'd got a stressful job, uh, an unhappy marriage, and I wanted something that could just take me away. And I'd heard about colouring books, and that's how I got into colour pencil. So I was colouring for sort of four or five months, and then I actually got into uh, my drawing. Um, do I use any other media? Um, when I first started drawing, I did use pastel. And I was quite poorly and then discovered that I was allergic to it. So I don't use pastel at all now. Um, and I have dabbled a little bit in oils, but colored pencil is my absolute love. And I feel incredibly guilty if I pick up <laughs> a paintbrush or something like that. Uh, Kathleen, I haven't ever used suede board, no. Um, oh gosh, Sam. Uh, okay, I'll cover this very quickly. Um, because I've made a pact with myself about what I'm going to do next time somebody says, uh, if you trace a line art, you're cheating. Okay, so I always do a line drawing for a photograph if doing a realism drawing like yourself. I read so many bad comments about cheating by other artists, even though I know a lot of famous artists use projectors, etc., onto canvas to create a uh, recreate a subject. If you did a live draw, would you still do the line drawing off the photograph to get the basic structures on the paper? I'm worried as I have a live drawing in a couple of weeks and I'm being judged by artists and tutors. Okay, th so Sam, I'm really sorry about that. Nobody should ever judge you. And you need to be, um, you need to have the self-belief that what you're doing is absolutely fine. Every single uh, live draw that I do, um, I have uh, traced the line art, I've given it to everybody who's doing the, um, uh, the live draw, and, uh, and then I project that trace line art on my projector onto my piece of paper and it's there. Um, I do have some videos on freehand drawing. I do do freehand drawing. Um, there's a few of my tutorials that are actually freehand drawn. Um, and quite frankly, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you do you. And I, the pact that I've given myself is next time somebody says to me on Facebook, which they regularly do, that tracing is cheating, I'm going to send them a line art and I'm going to challenge them to draw me a beautiful, realistic portrait using my line art that I've traced um, and see how they get on. Um, and we'll see, we'll see, shall we? Because even though you might have traced a line art, you've got to have the skills to be able to color it in. <laughs> and let's face it, we're not coloring it in, are we? We've got to learn, we've got to know about the, the values, we've got to know about the structure of the animal, we've got to know color theory, we've got to know all of this stuff. So Sam, you do you. Um, you know, and don't worry about what the people are doing. And if you're being judged by other people, block them. Um, right, let's have a look here. Uh, Lily, I use um, uh, pastel mat and I use drafting film for my animal portraits. Um, oh, Sandy, I struggle with arm and shoulder pain from drawing. Can you please give us some advice about how to height of desk, position of drawing arm, etc.? Yes. Now, one of the first question I asked Sandy is what surface do you draw on? Because I can't, well, I can, but I tend to not draw on 
uh, smooth surfaces and I tend to not draw on hot press paper because I have to use much harder pressure. Naturally, my pressure is very light. And once I start to use much heavier pressure, I end up with shoulder pain, I end up with wrist pain, and I have to have physio. So that's why I don't really use those papers uh, very often. That's something to have a think about. The other thing, when you're drawing and you've got three million pencils in this hand, and then you're drawing with this one, you, you're, you're using your muscles in this arm and you're sort of, you're probably sitting a little bit differently. So I would encourage you never to hold a whole bunch of pencils in this hand. You know, you just sit there with them sort of like there and you've got all of these pencils and they fall out and everything. So as you're drawing, make a habit of either having like a, a pot next to you here that you just take out and you use, but try not to hold a load of pencils in the hand. Um, I use an upright, mine's about 80 degrees, my drawing board. I find that much, much better for my uh, back and everything. I've also got this um, this chair here. So it's a, we can see that. <laughs> it's a Herman Miller uh, Mirror 2. Um, it's a fabulous chair. I've got a sheepskin on it as well, which keeps me warm or cool. And it's got this wonderful back. So I can sit at my drawing board. I can be right up close and then I can have a, yeah, look back. And then I'm, I'm constantly toing and froing. Um, and it's a very, very comfortable chair. My knees are, or my thighs are, um, you know, uh, horizontal to the floor and my feet are flat on the floor. So it's, that's really important. Um, let me just have a look at some of these questions because we've got an awful lot of them. Um, okay, so this is a, a few have come up with this same one. Does it help to change? A colour photo to black and white to see the values, yes, it can really, really help. So if you're struggling with your values, it's a really good idea to change your photograph to black and white and change your, if you take a picture of your drawing, change that to black and white. Have them together if you can on your screen or print them out and you will see straight away where your values are missing. When you take colour away, colour confuses everything. When you take colour away, you'll be able to see, oh, I need to get more value in there. I need to get that darker. Um, it's a good idea to have your, uh, so you've got like, a, oh, I haven't got it in here, value finder, the, the grayscale one. But it's also quite a good idea to have a, um, like a little uh, uh, colour viewer viewfinder. You know, you've got a piece of white card hole in it. You can do it uh, digitally or you can have a one that's actually uh, tangible and you can lay it over your photograph. You can lay it onto your uh, you know, iPad or screen or whatever. And you can actually then start to pick out what what value, not necessarily what color it is, but what value. That's where I really struggle is with skin tones. Um, and it's quite surprising how dark sort of relatively pale skin is, is really quite surprising how dark it is. And it's not until you isolate those colours, the shadows and everything, that you realise how dark it is. So use all of the tools that you can to help. Um, Carla, so when you draw a full picture of a horse, you do not look at every hair. How mentally crazy is that? But it is a drawing all about. No. So if you're drawing a full picture, so like a full picture of a dog, cat, horse, you, uh, the best photos for me are ones where you can't see the hairs and you just follow the, the, uh, the mapping of the lights and the darks. And you don't need all of those details, just overwhelm. Um, so you just follow the darks and the lights, definitely. Um, Kevin, um, it's open for a week. Uh, so it, I think the last day is the 18th that it's open. Um, oh, Vicky, uh, the, the Ignite Planner, I think you might need to have a PDF reader. Um, do, do, do. Let me have a look. Some people that are already Ignite members. Yes, of course, Debbie. Yep, yep. Um, if you're already an Ignite member and you want to join the live sessions, then um, you can, uh, we, they're already in the Ignite calendar. So the links are there for you. You don't have to sign up. Um, Nicola, what do you get with the Ignite membership? Um, gosh, so you get, sorry if you can hear my dogs barking. You get a, my foundations course. So it is a 40 hour course with uh, I think it's seven modules. I talk about uh, confidence, I talk about mindset, I talk, we talk about values, we go through all of the, um, the materials that we use, the different papers, the, the pencils. We then get into the actual 
uh, tutorial. So we draw eyes, we draw fur, and then at the end we draw, uh, there's a beautiful German Shepherd that we draw. And I, we, I've done it so that you're using different surfaces and different techniques. So you kind of get to know all of the different things. What I'm doing new this time for new members when they join um, in September is I'm also adding some um, extra live sessions in, live draw sessions in for new members. So we're, we're getting to draw together on um, pieces that are quite similar to what we've got in the foundations course. So it will get you uh, feeling confident about picking up your pencils and drawing. So we've got a couple of those, which is a little bit different. You then have all of my live streams. Um, so we do art club every Tuesday, which is amazing. We all get to draw together live, which is fantastic. Uh, I do a confidence session every month. We talk, I mean, I've had some guest, uh, uh, guest presenters, which have been amazing. Um, anything to do with confidence. I have a business drop in for anybody who's wanting to, um, develop their business. And, um, what else have we got? We have the, our uh, mastermind. So every couple of months we have a mastermind where I choose the picture, you then draw it, um, you don't share it. And then we have this session where we look at everybody's piece and, and we marvel at how unique everybody is. And it's wonderful. You get the fabulous community. Um, we I do 25 critiques every week. I think I don't think anybody does as many critiques as I do. Um, so you get the chance to have your work critiqued. Um, what else do we have? And all of the all of the tutorials in a really beautiful um, uh, hub, video hub. It's all in playlists. They're all uh, sort of set out, and it's it's all searchable. Um, we've got some other bits and pieces that we're adding onto it as well. So um, yeah, you get a you get a huge amount. You get a huge amount, and I'm very very uh, active in the community as well. Um, so it's all about getting people drawing and developing and doing what they want to do, basically. Um, so let's have a look. Um, OK, so I'm going to do a couple more questions here. Mia, how do you do realistic shadows? Uh, another really great question. So realistic shadows. I, I'm thinking possibly you're talking about when you're grounding a subject. Um, so that I would start very gently, get your shadows in the right place. Um, don't be scared about using a little bit of color in those shadows as well, but try to get them so that they fade out, um, you know, so they're not just sort of like a harsh line around. Then if you're talking about shadows on an actual subject, definitely look at your complementary colors. So um, if you've got something that's quite yellowy, uh, using the complementary color for yellow is a purple. You get the purple in there. We did that on the B uh, when we were drawing the B yesterday. Um, it's got a yellow band on it. We put violety colors in, purpley colors in for the shadow, and it gives you that beautiful shadow color. If you're drawing plants, using dark reds uh, in your greens to get those really dark shadows. So looking at your complementary colors is really good. Um, Elizabeth, that kind of picks up on your question as well. <clears throat> um, <laughs> so um, struggling to wanting to jump ahead to the next part <laughs> in anticipation uh, with the tutorials. Any suggestions on how to slow down? I think we're all very unique in how we work. Um, I do. I am quite speedy. Um, I think it's just about enjoying the process. So realizing that what you're doing right here, right now, and being very present in what you're doing is the is a wonderful thing to do, rather than anticipating how it's going to end up. And that's a that's a, a work in progress. Um, Judy, dollars um, a month, I think at the moment it's 38. Uh, the exchange rate uh, changes, obviously, so you'd need to check on that, but I think it's 38. Um, uh, uh, Elizabeth, how can I fix a two yellow area and make it more greyish? You only sent me a different pick of the cat's colours midway. Okay, so if you've got a yellow and you want to make it more greyish, I would definitely bring a little bit of... Um, yellow what have we got as the uh complementary colors uh, yeah i would definitely bring a little bit of violet in there if you look at the complementary colors for yellow I, I mean this is a bright yellow um but if you look at the complementary colors here we're talking um purples um this is definitely going to dull it down a little bit make it look a little bit grayer so you could use a um a luminance ultramarine violet you could use a luminance sepia 10 percent 
you could use a um a light fast mars violet it depends how, how dark you want to go but i would just glaze that color in over the top and it's just going to tone everything down and look beautiful um okay let me see gosh there's loads and loads and loads of uh, questions here let me see if i can um i don't think i can i don't think i can download this um okay so um not on facebook what will i miss out if i join ignite um you'll miss out on the on the community uh, marianne um although the community is partly in the uh, in the live streams that we do and those are all recorded and there's also areas where you can comment and ask questions and everything on the actual courses so it's just it's just the community element really in the facebook group you're not going to miss out on any announcements because they're all sent by email um i do i do completely understand people not wanting to be on facebook i get it you could set up just a a, a profile that you don't use and just join the group the group's completely private but i totally get it so that's that's all you're going to be i don't run any live streams usually on the um in facebook so you should be you should be fine um Okay, last question. Um, you said to draw in direction of fur, but not to draw every hair. Is that drawing in direction of fur, not the small strokes? Oh, um, is that drawing in direction of fur, not the small strokes of each hair? Then what is it? <laughs> so when you start, it may feel like you're putting in every single bit of hair. As you layer over, you're going to obliterate some of those. But obviously you want any pencil marks to be looking like they're going in the direction of the fur. You can imagine if you're drawing a, a horse or a dog and you're wanting a cur the curve, how the hair curves around an element. If you've got the fur going in a different direction, it's gonna look very strange if you see any of those pencil marks. It could be, sometimes I don't get any details on a photograph and I don't use straight lines, I'll use just circles. So I'll just it'll just be shading everywhere. You know, so if you can't see the direction of the fur, I definitely recommend you do little circles. But it's um, yeah, it's getting your head around it. It's really getting your head around it. And and th there were a couple of pieces, and and actually, it would be quite nice if I can. It's getting permission from people to ask if I can use their photographs without people thinking that I'm pulling their photograph to bits. If you see what I mean, um, to show you what I mean about we don't need to use all all of this um. Uh, we don't need to have all of these hairs. And if you do join Ignite, there are um, two years worth of critiques. And I talk about this an awful lot. And you'll be able to see fantastic drawings. Um, but then you'll be able to see how people have developed and just knocked out a little bit of the, the fur detail and how their pieces have elevated. So um, I just want to thank you all for coming tonight. Really, really uh, lovely session. I hope it's been useful. Hopefully you are going to join me um, a week on Sunday for the, uh, for the live draw. We're gonna be drawing some pause. Um, that's going to be on YouTube. Uh, if you haven't signed up already, then please do. Um, and of course the uh, Ignite membership opens on the 11th. So thank you all so much for joining me. Um, it's been uh, a pleasure chatting to you tonight, answering your questions, and um, I hope to see you all very, very soon. All right then, bye.